And as usual, let's begin with a word of prayer. <sighs> Father, what is your will for us? This is what we need to know at all times and dwell upon and think about and try to act upon. What is your will for us? We ask that you reveal that to us in our daily lives. And this we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay. We're going to look at the ministry of Paul. Paul had five journeys. We'll start with, of course, the first one. And you'll find it in chapters 13 and 14 in the book of Acts. But things are going to be a little different today in that you can follow along, but you probably will not be expected to read out loud. But you'll probably want to have it there in case you have something you want to check on. It's going to be for a couple of years from June of 44 to 46 AD. And they'll be going to the island of Crete and then to the territorial region of Galatia, which is in south central Turkey today. Barnabas and Saul traveled from Syrian Antioch to Crete, which was Barnabas' home. Then Paul and Barnabas traveled north through the region of Galatia and finally returning to Antioch. So here is the first journey. Starts over here in Antioch, they go down across the island of Cyprus, they sail up here, and then this is the region of Galatia here, and they visit towns there, and then they simply backtrack and go home. Okay? Any question about that? So whenever you hear Galatia, it's usually referring to this region. Then Paul goes to Jerusalem to meet with Peter and James to settle the question of requiring circumcision for the Gentile believers. This is all in preparation. Paul hears that the believers in Galatia were being told that in order to be saved by the Jewish Messiah, they must submit to the Jewish Torah to be circumcised, becoming Jews, and obey the laws and religious customs of Israel. So in the spring of 47 AD, Paul writes the letter to the Galatians. Okay, any question about the situation? Paul states the primary focus of the church, and you tell me if I'm incorrect in this one, but this is, at this point, this is what Paul is saying is the, the key. Galatians 2, 16 reads, Yet we know that a person is justified not by the works of law, but through faith in Jesus Christ. The faith of Jesus Christ. And we have come to believe in Christ Jesus, so that we might be justified by the faith of Christ, and not by doing the works of the law, because no one will be justified by the works of the law. Any questions? Thoughts? Or comments. Well, today it seems clear, but in those days when he said that, I suspect that it took many more words for people to get to understand what he was really trying to say. <laughs> they don't understand it today. <laughs> well, but so, but they had they had a, the Jewish people in particular this long history of being isolated, and so then the non-Jewish people, whoa, they won't talk talk to us, they, we don't like them. They won't eat with us, anything, yeah. Yeah, and so just the fact that he said that you're justified by faith uh, probably wasn't enough words. Yeah, he, he had been there before and he'd spent time there uh, instructing them. Mm -hmm. uh, and so this is kind of a, a summary statement for him. So he's reminding them, but so they would have understood mostly what it meant. Question or thought? What well, my yeah. thing here is being cranky and I can't get it up. <laughs> Yay, uh, technology. So I wanted to check and see what how it said it there. But right. here you have faith of Jesus Christ. Faith of Christ. Yes. Now we have, you know, believed in. Um, so I was just wondering 
the, why some places it's in and others it's of, because uh -huh. I, mean, I know Jesus did go to the cross with the faith that he would be Correct. resurrected. And that he was doing God's will. Yes. yes. Um, so I don't know, it just, it just struck me differently Good. that we were justified by the faith of Jesus. Jesus' faith, right. not ours even. Well, certainly, if nothing else, that would be a faith that we would look to as an example. Mm -hmm. uh, and the faith that he had made salvation available to us. And so we continue with our faith in what he did, in what he was, who he was. Maybe. But you're right. It's interesting. Anything else? The church must not yield to those who say that to be saved, one must obey an et oops, external. external law. <laughs> uh, me and my spelling. Even a spelling check. You see the technology. It's a real word. <laughs> external law. Galatians 5 1 reads For freedom, Christ set us free. Stand firm, therefore, and do not submit again to the yoke of slavery. What does that tell you? Well, so, part, in part, I think it depends on how you define freedom. Good. Because, of course, he's also talking to slaves, and he's not saying, you can go do whatever you want. <laughs> he, he, he's saying that Christ has, has freed you. You can believe in Christ, uh -huh. but, but that doesn't mean you don't have to go plow the field. <laughs> it's still better work. Um... Uh, the, for freedom, Christ said, Christ freed us from what? What are they suggesting he is freeing us from? Our own sins. No. No? The guilt. No. And the freedom. What would be the yoke of slavery here? What would be holding you a slave if you were a follower of Christ? Well, that would be the, um, the law. The law. That's the, that's the whole okay. point here. Okay. Is that... Uh, the Jewish uh, the circumcision party wants to force you to become a Jew and take on the Torah, and he says, no, that's being a slave to an external, not internal, law. That you need to be, Christ has set us free from that so that we are free. Mm -hmm. So it's a matter of the law that he's talking about here, not just a, a cultural thing, okay? It can also be spiritual. Because there are all kinds of behaviors uh -huh. that people can indulge in, yes. which enslaves yes. them. Yes, uh, many in, today in our lives. Oh, yes, right? absolutely. So that's the human condition. Very good. Okay, let's look at the next point. But then Paul goes into considerable detail to delineate the different behaviors that represent the acts that are not appropriate for believers. Galatians 5, 19 to 21. Now, the works of the flesh are obvious. Sexual immorality, impurity, debauchery, idolatry, sorcery, enmities, strife, jealousies, anger, quarrels, dissension, factions, envy, drunkenness, carousing, and things like these. I am warning you, as I warned you before, those who do such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. He must have sat a while thinking about this. That's a pretty it's, good list. It is a good list. It's and, not complete, but it's a good list. And, and I would venture to guess that without forgiveness, there aren't any of us who can <laughs> avoid that list. Oh, yeah. You're absolutely right. Yeah, it's pretty... This, but remember now, he's talking to people, to believers, and, and the church is just beginning. This is only the first decade of, of the church. And so he's talking to them, saying, this is behavior that is not appropriate. Okay? Some of you have been doing this most of your lives, mm -hmm. or raised to say that this is okay. But I give you this list as something to 
think about. Well, and he's also speaking to people who have not grown up with the Ten Commandments and the Levitical laws and all of that. That's very true, too. And so these people have probably accepted these as societal norms. Yes, they are. Uh, sexual immor immorality was definitely a norm it was all the time. Okay, What does he mean by impurity? Debauchery? I don't even know what that means. I'm never sure what that means. That's Idolatry, kind of, I know. Kind of crude, crude behavior. Crude behavior. Okay. Sorcery? Uh, we know that one. Enmity? That means being unhappy with one another? Enmity? Yeah, Almost. against another person. Just being yeah. Strife? That would be intentionally causing friction. Jealousy? Don't be jealous of one another. Don't be. Anger is a hard one. Because it is, because there's also, flares, yeah, there's righteous up. anger as well. It's true. And it's, uh, there are issues here with some of these quarreling. Is that, that's not a debate, that's a quarrel. That, it's just, like families. Just, yeah. Like children. Oh, well, let's go there. <laughs> dissension. Where you don't agree with the, the leaders, and that's the dissension. Factions. Us Politics. five over here don't like the 15 over there. We have a concern. But you're not, yeah, but you're not supposed to do factions. You're not supposed to envy. I, I understand envy will tear you apart, tear things apart. Drunkenness. Yeah, well, yeah, you don't want to do that too often, for sure. Carousing. Isn't that just like partying? Long parties, yeah. Yeah. And things like these. <sighs> well, we've kind of looked at the list a little bit, okay? These are things we should not be doing, he's suggesting. Then, Paul gives a brief insight, insight into behaviors that are appropriate for believers. Galatians 5, 22-23. By contrast, the fruits of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, generosity, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. There is no law against such things. So, now we look at the other side here, and it sure sounds a lot different from the first side. They are definitely opposites. Mm -hmm. Okay? And everything here is nice, but what if I have a flaming Irish personality? It's going to be hard on that self-control things a lot of times, you know? Um, being gentle all the time, uh, that's going to be tough. There are jobs I shouldn't be doing if I'm supposed to be gentle all the time. Uh, there are a lot of things to discuss here, aren't there? Mm -hmm. Okay? Any question or thought? Okay. Add that to that, Galatians 6 2, bear one another's burdens. And in this way, you fulfill the law of Christ. What does it mean, bear another's burdens? What? You mean I'm supposed to take care of them no matter what, for just because they want me to? Or, or it's meeting their needs when they have a special need and I have the ability to fulfill it? What does it mean to bear another's burdens? It, I, just, I just ask. I think this is something we need to look at. This is what the church is supposed to deal with. Well, I think it's, at least in my mind, that that's pretty easy one in that if someone needs something and they can't provide it themselves, you help them. Okay, there you go. I can just see that being abused. Well, sure. <laughs> you can abuse anything. Yeah, but that's true too. All right, here we go then. My caution, folks, and I apologize for this, but this is my concern and it's all mine. So bear with me, please. Frown frequently. Paul has stated that Christ has set us free from the spiritual law, the Torah. I call it spiritual, meaning its intent and focus is the spiritual aspect. That we should not submit to an, etern an external <coughs> spiritual law again. Galatians 5.1. We just went through that. And Paul clearly states that no other gospel, not even if it came from an angel or from Paul himself, should be allowed to change what the Galatians have already been told. Galatians 1.8. 
that sound, if I use external instead of eternal there, yeah. does that sound about right? That sounds like what he's saying? Okay. And the, those laws that you're calling quote unquote spiritual right. is it's the uh, laws affecting all of your behavior, which it's the, with it's the, the idea right. being that then you will be more in tune with and in touch with God. Right. It's not so much the physical as it is the emotional or the internal or the spirit, okay? Where it's put in terms of um, something from inside that's guided, okay? It's spiritual. Uh, the Torah was given at physically and meant physically, but it was also to control the spirits as well. To help them, to guide them into being good, loyal Proper Jews. Proper behavior, so that Correct. they Correct. But, right. the, but it's separated from the intent to the behavior. Any question or thought? Well, I just was, so in my mind, the way I would explain that would be that if you have, uh, for example, an elderly person who couldn't make real good uh, decisions, okay. buying, selling, whatever, right. okay? And you take someone who takes advantage of them and cleans them out. Yes. Okay. In the eyes of the law, you can't really write a law against that, because in theory, that person made the own, their own decisions. Right. You see that. But, but from the idea of morality, taking right. advantage of them is a completely different answer. I agree. And you might use the word moral in this case. Uh, sure. Spiritual. That's what I'm intending by calling it spiritual law. Mm -hmm. Okay, as opposed to uh, don't walk across the street against a red light. That's a that's a physical law. Okay, very good. Here we go then. Our salvation is a gift from God, it's not earned by our own effort, and our faith response is one of gratitude and desire of our spirit to do God's will. We are drawn to lead a life worthy of God because we desire to do God's will. We then do our best to live up to the spirit of God's will. And the free gift of forgiveness, when we fall short, allows us to continue to try free from guilt. Does that sound right? Question, thought, or comment? I'm, I'm just stating what I think is very clear. All right. Here we go. The will of God is summed up in the Old Testament by Moses and in the New Testament by Jesus. Do you think you know what it is? Well, so there are two very distinctive paths here. And what are they? Well, so the first one was really based on a legalistic explanation of what you do and don't do. Okay. Where Jesus' explanation says... It's based on love. Okay. Well, here I'm saying they're both going to say exactly the same thing. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, okay. and your neighbor as yourself. Yeah. Yeah, there we go. And Jesus says, this is the summation of the law, mm -hmm. the gospel. It's all there. This is it. This is the will of God for us as believers. Okay. Everything that is asked of us needs to be interpreted or perceived from these two points. Is that clear? Is that scary? Are you okay with that? Well, it takes thought. I mean, so, often, <laughs> so oftentimes we just kind of bumble along and just do stuff without thinking about it. Uh -huh. But in all of our Ideally, in all of our relations with other people, in the back of our minds, it should be, is this the loving thing to do? Good. Or is it the easy thing? Or is it, you know, the hard thing? Or is it but, an abusive thing? But is it, right. whether it's hard or easy, is okay. this the loving thing? And how is, how is love going to affect our relationship? Right. So let's look at number two here. It says, love your neighbor as yourself. This is going to determine our social structure. This is what we, this is what the point is. This is how, based on this, this is how I believe we evaluate what we should and shouldn't do. 
I know that's what you said. I just tried to put in words that I understood. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> so, knowing that this is where we must look when to find out if something is the will of God. This is the, the ruler, you might say, the gauge. Yet, when Paul or the church began to describe what is the will of God in an attempt to help believers, too often they include their own biased social interpretations and began to build a new law, the law of Christ, requiring conformity through external pressures. Now slow down, that's an awful big statement. Okay, and I'll skip Paul for the moment, but let's jump ahead. The church during the Middle Ages. Were they following the love of your neighbor as yourself? Absolutely not. Absolutely not. So, it, over the hundreds and hundreds of years getting to that point, something went wrong. Okay? It started with Paul, in my opinion. As you'll see, this is why I said you're going to get to look at Paul in a slightly different way. Okay? I wondered if Paul himself fell into the trap that he warned us about. The sinful tendency of the human condition is for those in authority to strive for the conformity of others to do things the revealed, I'm sure it's spelled wrong, yeah. way. Okay? They call it the revealed way. I mean, this is from God, but maybe it isn't. Maybe there's a, something else involved in here. They're, they're making a mistake, at the very least, sometimes. Certainly the church, by the time the Middle Ages was going, was making a lot of mistakes, you might say, building upon the mistakes of others. Okay? And though it is often meant well, too often it has become an abuse and a way to manipulate believer, believers for their own good. I'm not putting negative reasoning on it, that it is done in order to abuse. But it's, it started off as, we want to do the best we can to help you, but you need to change your way of doing this, or you shouldn't be doing that. Is what I'm saying make some sense? Not the details, sure. but in general. We have a tendency as a human species to build on what went behind and before us. Okay? And that's what I think is going to happen. Go ahead. Question? Okay, here we go. What the temple leadership did in the Old Testament times, the Pharisees and Sadducees did in the time of Jesus, and the Pope and the bishops did in the Middle Ages, I believe is still happening in the church today. That they're not, that they're not appropriately describing the will of God or, or living within the will of God. That they are doing it maybe for the best reasons, but I think that there are mistakes being made. And I think, well, anyway, that's my thought. So, go ahead. Joanne had a cousin who wanted to get married. He was living with his girlfriend, and he went to the church to get married. And the church said, no, we can't marry you. You're living together in sin. <laughs> is that not marrying them? Is that the will of God? Well, that's, that's that, the question that, that's, that needs to be so, asked. Right. That's, th and that's <laughs> the question. You know, if you don't marry them and they continue to live together, are you perpetuating a problem? Well, you if know? they repent, ah, rep if they they repent. repent, how long do they need to be apart before... Well, they can be back together again. Yeah. yeah. I, it's just well, like, and those, how many angels can sit on the right. head of a pin? And, and those <laughs> questions do go all the way back to the they Middle do. Ages, sure. Yes, they sure do. They go back before that. Yeah. Okay? So, things like, and I'll, I don't want to bring up too much of this because I don't want to talk about it as much here, but should women speak in church? Women are supposed to be silent and out and not heard. Not, mm -hmm. and, uh, are they second-class citizens? Should there be slavery? These are things that were social, social at the time, that were acceptable. Mm -hmm. And it sounded as though they were included as the will of God. And I'm not sure that that's appropriate. So I think, here's the conclusion. So, one question you should try to answer as we look at the growth of the church under the guidance of Paul is whether or not each position is truly the will of God. 
It's something we need to do on a regular basis. <sighs> Does this make sense to you in some form or shape? Sure. Not the details of it, just well, overall. So, but also, over time, things change. Ha! <laughs> and, and, really? Well, and but the word of God does not change. Well, but the point is, yeah. now we can have women that are highly educated. Yeah. They did not have those then. They were, they were kept away from all of that Doesn't stuff. matter. You see, if I interpret it and say, I will read this scripture exactly as it says, mm -hmm. that is what I have to live with. Sure. And therefore, women should not speak in church, and they should cover yeah. their heads, and slaves should obey their masters, and you, you know. Yep. But I'm saying I, I can learn from them. Yes. And we always can learn by looking back what is the will of God in all these things. Okay? I'm going to shut up for a second. You okay? Okay. Now, we've gotten through that caution. Let's get back to what we were doing. <laughs> the second journey of Paul was found in Acts 15 through 18 parts of. Between 49 and 52 AD, he travels through Galatia to Corinth to Jerusalem. Don't worry, you know I have maps for you. Paul and Silas walk from Antioch through Galatia, then twice blocked by the Holy Spirit from where they intended to go, finally end up in Troas, Mysia. There, Paul had a vision of a man from Macedonia pleading with him to come to Greece. So, they start here in Antioch, and they go back through Galatia, over to Troas. He gets his vision saying, come over here to us. Okay, I'm just setting up the scene for you. And he, oh, later on, of course, they'll do all this other traveling and come back. Okay, especially on this one, you want to notice, well, yeah. You want to notice where Philippi is, Thessalonica, Athens, and Corinth. Mm -hmm. Those are places he'll be going. Question or thought? Paul traveled through Neapolis, Philippi, Thessalonica, Berea, Athens, and staying in Corinth for a year and a half. <sighs> now, let's go to work. <laughs> Paul wrote his first letter to the Thessalonians in the spring of 51 AD. Paul encourages the believers to live a life worthy of God. Hmm, what does that mean? Okay, that's always the question now. 1 Thessalonians 2.12 reads, urging and encouraging you and pleading that you lead a life worthy of God, who calls you into his own kingdom and glory. What does that tell you if you are in Thessalonica? You. Well, you need to change what you're currently doing. I need to change? Sure. Yes. What, what you're currently doing. What I'm currently doing. And to, to try to lead a life that... Uh, is worthy of God would tell me that everything I did I would have to stop and think about <laughs> it first. <laughs> yeah, right? pretty much. Um, why is are you trying to lead a life worthy of God? Is it because of some external push against you or is it because you want to? I see several things. Here it's primarily because you want to. Yeah. And this is early, this is very early in his, in his ministry. And so he can set us up in a more positive fashion. So um, I'm just urging you to just do what God wants. Do what you want to do, which is follow God. And bring and that's, him glory. And bring him the glory. And, and, and that, yes. is, that is kind of aimed at physical, mechanical things that we do, it seems. But, I think this one is aimed more at the reason behind it. Well, I guess that, that's where I was going with that, is, oh. is in my mind, you wouldn't be able to uh, apply those mechanical actions without reasoning out, why am I doing what I'm doing? Yeah. Yeah. 
it's good, well, yeah, keep in mind what you want and do it whenever you can, might be a good way of putting it, you know, because I'm going to forget and half the time I'm going to do something wrong and thank God for forgiveness, literally, okay? All right, here we go. Paul encouraged the believers to enthusiastically prepare for spiritual battle. 5.8 reads, But since we belong to the day, not the night, okay, let us be sober and put on the breastplate of faith and love, and for a helmet, the hope of salvation. This is how you defend your spirit that wants to do the will of God. You live in faith and love and hope. That seems to be what he's saying. This is why I say it's more of the, uh, back to the spiritual issue here, the moral. What's inside me, my spirit wants to do. I need to protect it. I have to protect it from other things around. Okay, so he's suggesting faith, love, and hope. Question or thought? All should be done giving thanks to God. In 1 Thessalonians 5, 16 to 18, it reads, Rejoice always. Pray without ceasing. Give thanks in all circumstances, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. He said it specifically. This is the will of God. That we rejoice, we pray, and give thanks for whatever is happening. Again, this is the motivational side of it, okay, I think. Any question, thought, or comment? Pray without ceasing. Woo! You know, one of the things that I th am thinking about is um, if you go to, for example, Greece, and you look around at, what, at, at what's left, the ruins that are yeah. there, and Mostly what's there are, of course, there's old houses, yeah, ba most buried, but, um, there's also, but there's also temples all over the place. Yes. And he was in a society there where uh, no one knew what they were doing, it would seem. <laughs> uh, I mean, it, it was, I mean, you, you look at the temple to Athena and to Apollo and to Zeus and all of those all things, of and... And it, it had to have been nothing but mixed messages to everyone. Yeah, and they were all capricious creatures. Yeah. So, yeah. We, on the other hand, are going to do everything to the glory of God, for the glory of God. Um, that's His will for us, is that we, we're going to be rejoicing. We're going to have a positive attitude in life. We're going to pray without ceasing. Always not just asking, but giving thanks and, and being in communication with God. Uh, and being thankful for all that we can, all that God has given us. This is going to be a whole different way of thinking, if you'll pardon my expression, of a being. And um, that's what he's suggesting. And again, I think this is internal that he's dealing with. Here we go. While it is inevitable that they examine many facets of their new lives, they should carefully set aside what is not appropriate and hold on to what is according to God's will. Here we go. 1 Thessalonians 5, 21. Test everything. Hold fast to what is good. Okay. Any question or thought? No other than it would take me a long time to do anything if I had to stop and think <laughs> about it first. So get into the we, habit right, of doing but, it. But, do but, it without ceasing. Right. But but we do so many things, you know, <laughs> yes. any of us in a given day. Oh, yeah. And if you had to stop and think about why am I doing this and would uh -huh. this align with God's will, uh, I'm going to spend a lot of time thinking and, and, and a whole lot less time doing. Without ceasing. Yes. Always. So, and you're right. It's going to take a lot of time and that is appropriate. You've got to stay in that proper relationship. So anyway... Hold fast to what is good. So, but everything's going to be tested. Here we go then. In the fall of 51 AD, Paul writes a second letter to the Thessalonians. At that time, Paul is probably concerned with the behavior of a few. We do have a typo in Thessalonians. Oh, I see it. <laughs> yeah. 
Paul reminds them that they received guidance from himself. I, Paul, have guided you. That they should hold on to what he has taught them. Here we go. 2.15 in Second Thessalonians reads, So then, brothers and sisters, stand firm and hold fast to the traditions that you were taught by us, either by word of mouth or by letter. Okay. So as long as everything by word of mouth and everything by letter was according to the will of God, this is appropriate. But if he slipped something in by accident or on purpose, this is going to start compounding into problems. Or if we inter misinterpret. If we Good. We misinterpret. And that happened a lot. You bet. So now hold on to the things that we taught you, whatever they were. Okay, here we go. Paul has heard that there are some who refuse to work, but expect others to take care of their needs. We were talking about this a little while ago. Such is not acceptable. Second Thessalonians 3.10 For even when we were with you, we gave you this command. Anyone unwilling to work should not eat. Even if you can feed them, you shouldn't. Is that what it says? If they refuse to work, so unwilling is unwilling. Different, different from unable. I didn't say anything about unable. Yeah. This is strictly yeah. unwilling. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. And I you, mean, that's, you shouldn't help them out. Yeah. Really? I thought we were supposed to, you know, we're not, talk to them. We're not, well, you can do that, but you're not supposed to enable the Enabling. And don't we do that in this country? But lot. this, but but this does this does in part go against one of the things Christ said. Which was? Which, which was, give to anyone who asks. Anyone who asks, for whatever reason. Yeah. So, we My, have to wonder if this particular position that Paul takes is according to the will of God. Mm -hmm. um, this congregation gives food to people, they never come to church, they don't have to believe in Christ, nothing. They just come and get food and go away. Mm -hmm. Is that according to the will of God? I don't know. It's something that has to be considered. Here we go then. Any other question or thought yet? Here we go. Even if some people take advantage of the believer's generosity, do not allow them to dictate a change in your attitude or behavior such that you stop being generous to other believers in their need. In their need. Thessalonians 3.13 Brothers and sisters, do not be weary in doing what is right. Have I interpreted that correctly? I think so. I think so. Or I wouldn't have done it that way. So, just because others abuse the system, you might say, shouldn't prevent me from helping those who are not abusing the system. That's what it's saying. I'm trying to say here. Um, there are believers who need help, want help, ask for help. And there are others who keep doing that, but they're not really uh, willing to do what's appropriate. And I must not give up my, change my attitude toward giving in the name of God. These are things we have to think about as we go along. Here we go. Anything, question or thought? Here we go then. Remember that Paul proclaimed the good news and the Holy Spirit was his guide. If someone refuses the instruction that Paul gave, then separate from them in hopes that they will see the error of their way and can once, and can once attain, again, join the fellowship. I'm sorry. 2 <laughs> Thessalonians 3, 14 and 15 reads, Take note of those who do not obey what we say in this letter. Have nothing to do with them, so that they may be ashamed. Do not regard them as enemies, but admonish them as brothers and sisters. Obey is the word I'm looking at in this one. Now Paul is saying, they need to do exactly what I said. No arguing, no dissension, nothing. They must obey. Now this concerns me. 
that Paul may have slipped, for good reason, but Paul may have slipped into an error. Well, obey does certainly take you back to the rule of law. It does, and that has been abused so much from the beginning of time, a human, a human society. Question of thought. Thought. Go ahead. Uh, <laughs> I, I don't exactly know how to put this. Good. And I, I can see both sides of it. Good. But, you know, we could say, all right, um, yes, we all sin and we all fall short yes. in many different ways. Yes. But we're trying. Hopefully we're growing in Mm -hmm. in understanding and all. Mm -hmm. But then on the other hand, there may be others who are just kind of going, you know what, I don't care what you say. Mm -hmm. I want to do this and I'm going to do it. Right. And I think maybe, you know, maybe I am not completely obedient to oh, the, the fruits of the Spirit. Right. Okay. Oh God, I wish I were. <laughs> um, but you know, to be deliberately going the way that I know is not pleasing to God. And well, having, Paul has told me is not pleasing well, to God. Well, you know, and, okay, and there are, there's the Ten Commandments, and there's, like, we've yeah. been told about all these, you know, nasty things that we uh -huh. shouldn't be doing. But if we're just like, you know, I don't care. I don't care what you say. I yeah. want all of the, the privileges of, you know, being in this group, but... I'm just going to do my own thing. In this one thing, I'm not going to change. I don't care what you say, Paul. And Paul goes, oh, well, if you have that attitude, we need to get you out of the group. Well, and Away so, from the church. Not so that it hopes that you will then rediscover what you should be doing. So a part of this at the time, I'm sure, was uh, just like it was up through the early 19th century, um, when you had nobility that people thought were were ordained by God, mm -hmm. and so therefore you do whatever the nobility tells you. Yep, that's right. So you're a peasant. You're going to live in squalor, so the nobility can live in comfort. In yeah, yeah, and yeah. and so the point is, these people were also under that system. Yes, and so I think in a lot of cases, uh, maybe the words that they use are already imprinted in their brains. I think you're right. Okay, but so... But if you think of it as a family, uh -huh. brothers and sisters... Yes. Um, you know, if you've got someone in the family that is just causing trouble... Yes. ...and is blatant about it and yes. doesn't care... I mean, yes. they're not showing the law of love by any means... Yes. ...then maybe it's like, you know what... Maybe you well, ought to go just, live with your grandparents. Yeah, or something <laughs> like that. You know, why don't you, you don't want to be part, be of, the part family. of the family. Right. Then, mm -hmm. you know, we'll see you later. Yeah. I don't know. It, it, I'm not asking anybody to know. I'm asking us to think. Because of the word obey here brings other thoughts to mind. And so I just, it, this is for thinking. Those, those kinds of people tend to... Those talk. kind of people. Oh, aren't you just... <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> you know, if someone is being blatantly whatever, you know, and, uh -huh. and they party it, on it a regular causes, basis. It causes trouble in the. Yeah, the they argue with, with the parent. That's, that's it. You know, you're not supposed to cause dissension, child. You're supposed to do what you're told. I don't know. It's kind of. Anyway, it's food for thought. What is the will of God? In the spring of 52 AD, Paul begins his journey home. He passes through Ephesus, Patara, Caesarea, and Jerusalem. Then he arrives home in Antioch during the summer of 52 AD. Third journey, part one. Okay, it goes from Acts 18 to 24. We're not going to get through this right now. Between the years 54 and 58 AD, from Galatia to Ephesus to Philippi and to Jerusalem. The map will come up. In the spring of 54 AD, Paul again begins a journey, his third, by visiting the churches of Galatia. 
He then continues to Greece where he visits Ephesus, which he makes his headquarters for the next two years. And I'll point it out. He starts over here, he comes again through Galatia, and he goes straight over to Ephesus. And he's going to spend two years there. Doing what? That's going to be the fun part here. After that, he'll, he'll sail up and around and we'll get to that later. He seems to have made a brief visit to Corinth and then returned to Ephesus by ship. There he receives a letter from Corinth and in the spring of 55, he writes the first letter to the Corinthians. A painful letter. Those that continue to live in unacceptable relationships should be removed from the fellowship. He's getting a little tough, tough love here. 1 Corinthians 5.13 God will judge those outside. Drive out the wicked person from among you. This is cold-blooded. This is straightforward. If they are not one of us, they must be removed. Because they will pollute the rest of us. You know, that was... That would be my phrase. That was very much part of the Torah. And there was purpose to that. Yes, there is. Because you, in order to have... We're so <laughs> weird about this now. You know, God does not see something or yes. pure. Pure. But if you want things to go in the direction that they are meant to go, yes. you have to... You have to Separate. pull the weeds. Yeah, right. Pull you the know, weeds. if you want a good crop, you've got to pull the at least most of the weeds. You know. Uh, anyway. So it's like the Amish keep all this other stuff away from us, so that we can continue in the way in which we believe is appropriate for us. And I, I totally agree with that. I don't have a problem. So there's a point to do that. It'll depend on how you define a wicked person. Yeah. In this case. So let's go on. In Paul's opinion, certain people will not enter the kingdom of God. Now, here we go. Here's a list for you to consider. Corinthians 6, 1 Corinthians 6, 9 to 10. Do you not know that wrongdoers will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived. The sexually immoral, idolaters, adulterers, male prostitutes, men who engage in illicit sex, Thieves, the greedy, drunkards, revilers, swindlers, none of these will inherit the kingdom of God. There is a heck of a list. And it certainly is not complete. Okay? But is this the will of God on each one of these items? <laughs> well, if, you know, hmm? if these things are characteristic of a person's life. Uh -huh. These are attitudes and behaviors which do not... Be careful what you're saying now. They're not sustainable. Upli uplift right. uh -huh. uh, society or individuals. Why are we protecting society? It's our society. It's only the church we well, should be well, thinking about. Well, the church society. Okay. okay. All right. Um, so go back and look at the at the woman that was caught in adultery, uh, in adultery and, and what happened there. Jesus did not say, you know, uh, you got away with it. He <laughs> said, sin no more. Yeah. Yeah. That's right. There's no yeah. here to accuse you. Sin no more. Yeah. Okay. But is it a sin, I'm talking about modern times, for men to have homosexual relationships. Is it a sin? Is it a violation if they love one another? Is it a violation of the will of God that they be together? Be careful. I'm not asking for an answer. I'm asking for thought. Okay? Um, thieves. If a person has no other way of creating enough for their survival, Thievery may be needed for them to get enough food for their families, especially in some other countries, not this one. What is greedy? Greed is wanting more than you have, or wanting more of it than you necessarily need. 
We do that all the time with the money in our savings accounts. We have more than we need, therefore are we greedy? Are we not therefore going to inherit the kingdom? <sighs> Sailors, I mean, I mean drunkards, <laughs> swindlers, you know, the, the con man. Where is the will of God in this? So, Are we kicking all these people? Anyone who does any of this needs to be removed from the congregation? So in, in right along next to drunkards, you could add drug uh, yeah. abusers. Yeah. You could add, I mean, there's a whole lot of pieces to this. Oh, yeah. And so I guess the thing that I see is, uh, in a lot of these cases, these actions are, uh, you can't sustain a, decent society uh, with the actions in place. And so you've got to have some kind of um, control, I guess is what I'm trying to say. <laughs> oh, but, no, we want control. Well, but, but... But control from where? From inside. Yes, yes. Not from outside. That's the key to this question of the will of God. And I was referring to self-control. Yes. But... Also, when he talks about these people should be removed from the group. Yes. Okay, if it's tearing the group apart. Yes. Right? Oh, yeah. I, I'm totally with you on that. Just so there have to be places where lines have to be drawn, and we have to be kind of mm -hmm. cautious. Uh, the church picks up on this later and totally abuses the entire medieval yes. society. Yes. Because that's a tendency in human nature. So where maybe there are some corrections that need to be made by the modern church to undo some of what was accidentally happened or was exaggerated from that time. I don't know. All I'm saying is we have to be cautious. Always go back and look at the will of God. Love your neighbor as yourself. That's a hard one. Okay? Applied to just this but, text. Go ahead. But first, love God with all your heart, and soul, what, mind, and strength. You know, I've, God did reveal certain standards of uh -huh. the way He wanted people in order for the best, so that they could live the best life they could. Don't get off onto these other paths that lead to and other problems. That was the Torah, which Paul says. Don't get locked into that slavery again. But what God revealed in part was, it, this is just my guessing here in a sense, don't hurt others. God doesn't want us to hurt others. God wants us to, to live together, to live with God, to, 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 to live in unity in a sense. And strive for that. And when we fail, go for the forgiveness because that's all we've got. Well, and you look at that list, mm. and in general, those behaviors are not loving. Those are behaviors that are going to hurt some the individual. Of them, some of them are, yes. yes. Many of them. Yes. And they hurt other individuals. They can even hurt yourself. Yes. Um, I, I, I agree with you. Many of these, I think, are within the will of God. That he mean. But some of them may not be. And that's all you have to look at each time. See, it takes forever. <laughs> Constant, right? Okay, Paul spends considerable time cautioning us not to let our freedom in Christ to cause others who have, who are weaker in their faith life to sin. Okay, 1 Corinthians 8, 9. But take care that this liberty of yours does not somehow become a stumbling block to the weak. That's a guidance. That's a guidance for us from the Spirit. To, to not let the fact that I can afford it, I can do it, I'm great. Don't let any of that block someone else to stand in their way of their faith life. It's tough. This is all going to have to be evaluated one thing at a time until it's been such a habit we don't have to think about it. <laughs> One of Paul's core beliefs regarding the behavior of members of the church is that order is paramount. Yeah. <laughs> oh yeah, 1440, but all things should be done decently and in order, or in good order, right? I like this one. And clearly he hasn't seen my garage. Uh, well, he didn't say all things. 
I don't, this I like, because this is the way I am, <laughs> okay? And I, but some other people are mm, artistic and go with the flow kind of people, and that's part of their personality. And we don't get along that well with one another, you know. I like this one. But is it the will of God for me to step in on somebody else's way of being and say, you have to do it my way? This is a challenge. But it was necessary for Paul at the time to have things done in good order. He had a real heck of a society back then. Far worse than we have today. It separated the church from the society. Church was new. Okay, here we go. During Paul's two years in the area, considering mission work is his primary concern, he didn't want to be a pastor, is that it is likely Paul spent a lot of his time on the road establishing other churches in the area, such as maybe Smyrna, Pergamum, Thyatira, Sardis, Philadelphia, maybe others, we don't know. But for two years, he's going to sit around just being a pastor. This work he would have done primarily in the summer month of 55 AD after his return from Corinth. In the fall of 55 AD, Paul travels to Philippi, that's by sea, goes up from Ephesus to Philippi, where he writes a thankful letter to the Corinthians. The second letter is Corinthians, chapters 1 through 9, based on information he received from Titus. Second letter of Corinthians is divided into two parts, 1 through 9, 10 through 13, because they're very different and have whole different approaches. Paul's mood is a beat. He reminds Corinthians that we are a people that walk by faith. 2 Corinthians 5, 7. For we walk by faith, not by sight. That is so critical for members of the church. Walk by faith in all things. It is still important that believers not be bound together with unbelievers. Now wonder what he means by bound together. 2 Corinthians 6, 14a reads, Do not be mismatched with unbelievers. Is this a marriage situation? I don't think that's what he's referring to. Marriage could be business. It could yeah. be business. It could be spiritual life. Right. You have a heathen, so-called, or a whatever, to you, and the non-believer and the believer are going to have a mismatched situation. They should not be bound together that way. Stick to your own kind. <laughs> Not culturally, but in the faith. Is that according to the will of God? Is that something, should they be kicked out of the, of the church because they are not doing it according so, to Paul's thinking? So there's a couple of parts to this. One of them, as an example, if you're trying to educate a non-believer right. to understand why you believe what you do, yeah. okay, that you would spend time with that non-believer for that purpose. Absolutely. If it were going the other way... Oops. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Mm. We can't have that influence that would destroy our church family, using a phrase. Yes. Okay? So, everything has to be thought out according to the will of God. It would appear that in the summer of 56 AD, Paul was imprisoned in Ephesus and took the time to make a personal request. Onesimus, a slave, had escaped from his master, Philemon, had become a believer and was serving Paul. Paul writes the letter to Philemon, requesting that Onesimus be treated as a brother, freed, and returned to Paul. Believers should consider doing voluntarily what formerly they might have been felt compelled to do. Philemon 14 reads, But I prefer to do nothing without your consent in order that your good deed might be voluntary and not something being forced. Okay? That's a, an attitude for the church. So, Things should come from the desire. From inside the desire, the desire not an external requirement. Mm -hmm. this, <laughs> relating to the church, this, everything goes back to the will of God. Everything has to go back to those two things. Okay? And not being forced to submit to an external law again. Paul also took time to write a letter to the Philippians in which he encouraged it. 
in which he encourages the believers to look out for the interest of other believers even ahead of one's own interests. Philippians 2.4 reads, Let each of you look not to your own interest, but to the interest of others. This is a really nice guide where you're not putting yourself first, but in others, and how best to help them become members of the church. And they're doing the same thing. And they're doing the same thing. thing for you, even. That would be a really nice attitude, and it would be wonderful if it were common. Again, everything has to be evaluated according to the will of God. Do not dwell on the past. Instead, keep your focus on the goal of the call of God through Jesus. Philippians 3, 13 to 14 reads, Brothers and sisters, I do not consider that I have laid hold of it, but one thing I have laid hold of, forgetting what lies behind and straining forward to what lies ahead, I press on toward the goal, toward the prize of the heavenly call of God in Jesus Christ. The past is past, or it's forgiven. Move on and keep refocusing refocusing on the will of God. Keep your mind focused on what is true, honorable, right, pure, lovely, good repute, excellent, worthy of praise. 4.8. Find brothers and sisters, whatever is true, honorable, just, you know, whatever I just went through. If there is any excellence, and if there is anything worthy of praise, think about those things. Don't focus on the negative, focus on the positive. That's a great advice. Then Paul was released from prison in the spring of 57 AD. Timothy had returned from his visit to Philippi. Paul then wrote his foolish letter to the Corinthians. Second letter is Corinthians 10 through 13. Paul summarizes his request to them that they be like-minded and live in peace. 13.11c reads, Agree with one another and live in peace. Good advice. It just isn't going to work most of the time. People are going, but find ways to work it out according to the will of God. And next time, we'll start with part two of the third journey.